So lately I've been learning about anti-racism, and if you learn enough about anti-racism, at some point you'll come across the book White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Online you can also find plenty of criticism of the book, mostly from clueless white people, though. There's plenty of legitimate criticism of it, absolutely, and I'll be getting to that in this video, so, or some of it anyway, um, but the links are all in the description as they are with all my videos. Uh, what I'm going to do today is look at uh, a, a video that I saw as I was doing research uh, into anti-racism. It was suggested to me, it said like, this book is super toxic, you'll see in a sec. Uh, and it was about white fragility, and I uh, the the book White Fragility, and I thought maybe that meant that uh, the this woman was coming from like a feminist perspective or like you know uh, criticism that it doesn't go far enough, but really she's just got the kind of typical right wing criticism of the book, and I wanted us to take a look at what she says about it. Because she's got, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of subscribers. So maybe what she's saying is actually pretty important. The, the title of this video, it's supposed to be provocative, but it's not an insult, okay? I'm white too. And I used to be just as fragile as Karlyn Borisenko, who we're going to take a look at. I used to be just as fragile as she was. But then I did a lot of learning. I did a lot of reading, you know, open-minded reading of books like this. And I started learning. You can learn. And you can learn not to be so fragile. <laughs> Let's see if anything uh, we can figure out today will help you become less fragile. I don't think there's any hope for Carlin. Let's take a look at her video, shall we? <laughs> I don't know how to make it through this book. I think I'm losing it. I'm losing my mind. <laughs> so that's how open-minded she was while she was reading the book. No, no, we're not. not really counting on me. I'm being totally sarcastic. But this book is insane! It's this insane, book is guys. Insane! Insane! It's insane! What the hell? What the hell? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that video you saw of me looking a little extra crazy, a little extra, is because I spent half my day today reading White Fragility. This cursed book. Cursed. Not nice. I'm not kidding. This is probably the most toxic book I have ever read in my life. And I'm only halfway through it. Only halfway done. I still have a whole second half of the book left to go. But I wanted to make this video <laughs> while this stuff was still fresh in my mind. If you follow me on Twitter and or Parlor, you saw me tweeting an awful lot today about the nonsense that's in this book. And listen, I knew from the very beginning, I knew from the beginning that this book was going to have nonsense in it because in the introduction right here, we're already seeing, we're already seeing nonsense in this introduction when she says, in my early days of my work, when I was then what was termed a diversity trainer, I was taken aback at how angry and defensive so many white people became at the suggestion that they were connected to racism in any way. The very idea that they would be required to attend a workshop on racism outraged them. They entered the room angry and made that feeling clear to us that the day throughout the day as they slammed their notebooks on the table, refused to participate in exercises, and argued against any and all points. And the reason I knew that was BS is because I'm a corporate trainer. I do corporate training while well, in, in in normal times when I'm actually allowed to go places, I do corporate training all the time. I do corporate training several times a month. I have done hundreds of corporate trainings. I have trained thousands of people. I can count on one hand the number of people that have come into one of my trainings and they've been angry and they've been slamming their notebooks on things. And that, that includes... 
Um, have you been training white people on anti-racism? Trying to force them to confront any racist tendencies or feelings that they have deep down inside? Because, you know, sales training or, or marketing or I don't know what you're into doesn't usually cause people to slam their books on the table. So maybe we're talking about two different things. Well, that, that includes, by the way, I've actually worked with diversity trainers. Not like crappy diversity trainers like Robin D'Angelo, but like actually good diversity trainers that have good ideas. I've even worked with them and I haven't seen this nonsense. There's actually only been one person in any training that I have ever done that has refused to do exercises. And guess who it was? It was an old white lady that is one of the biggest SJWs I have ever met in my life. Oh, yeah, those SJWs are the worst. to participate in my exercises. And so this is in the very beginning of the book. That's one way you can know that she's on the right, that she says something about SJWs. I hate SJWs. I've never met one of these people, these SJWs. I'm not sure what they look like or who they are or how they think, but, you know, they're... They're always bad. That I know from listening to people on the right. Look, so I knew right away that this was not going to be right the away. most fun read I've ever read. I already made my mind up. I, I, Good however, for you, Carlin. Honest, I did not anticipate just how toxic this cursed book no, is. So Listen, toxic. In fact, we're going to throw that book. Oh, throw that wow. Book. Such, I wanna, such performance. The book is gone. That book is... Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to keep the, the facts don't care about your feelings stuff till the end of the video. But <laughs> She's so good at performing. No wonder she has all these followers. Let, let me just say that one of the reasons you're seeing me in a hat right now is I had to have a go, good long meditation session and a really <laughs> long shower before I did this video because I felt so sick oh, after dear. reading half the book. And I'm going to explain more about that at the end. Carmen. We're going to save that for, for, all, for all the conservatives that don't want to hear about feelings and squishy things and like whatever. Um, we're going to save that till the end, okay? But let's just talk about facts. Let's just talk about the nonsense let's do it that's in this book so we're gonna go through several maybe more than several maybe several several of my highlights from the first half of the book but before we get into that yep, folks me. if you like my content uh, even if it pisses this. you off like i really hope this video does but if you like my content you like me exposing this nonsense to the world please subscribe to my channel to uh, turn on those notifications give it a thumbs up if you think you're subscribed just double check that because on Friday, YouTube unceremoniously subscri unsubscribe hundreds of people from my from my channel. So if you are subscribed on Friday, you might not be subscribed anymore. Just go ahead. And She's still talking about subscribing. That. All right, let's get in to this nasty, oh. nasty content, shall we? So one of the things I want to highlight is one of the things that D'Angelo does throughout this book is she makes the assertion that. Many people think this, and many people think that. So I literally just started underlining any time I saw many participants claimed this, or many people saw that, or things like that. Many, many white participants who lived in... So like, she makes these broad generalizations about... Well, 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 many is not a broad generalization. And it's also not necessarily untrue. I mean, you use words like generalization as if we're supposed to know, oh, well, a generalization must be wrong. Many people, or about, in some cases, entire populations of people, and she doesn't have data to back it up. Now, I'm actually a qualitative researcher when I do academic e research. I do qualitative research. What that means is I actually researched the lived experiences Ooh. but the thing of it is is when you're doing qualitative research in a, an accurate way and an authentic way is there is actually a process you have to go through to analyze lived experiences it's not just willy-nilly someone had said they had lived experience and you take that for all it's worth I, so i you know there are proper ways to do this i'm also a fan of using stories and personal anecdotes when you're writing things but not when you're making broad generalizations about entire populations from people, of people rather, that you don't back up with data. It just makes no sense. I'm not really sure how you could find data on the things that 
she's saying here. Like, like, does, did anybody uh, count the number of white people who reacted to to white, you know, diversity training or whatever this is by slamming a book on the table? Like, are there are there numbers on that? Um, are there even numbers of just like people who didn't take it well? And hey, there might be. Maybe just she thought it wasn't necessary to put in her book because in this case it's anecdotal. It's not like every study that's that's, that's in the book is anecdotal because there are studies, there is data, or there are data in it. But just not right at the beginning? Is that unsatisfying for you? Really, she's talking about her own experiences. She's saying, in my experiences, many white people at these these trainings have, uh, have reacted this way. Is that really so hard to believe? And she does it throughout this book. She does not provide data to support her claims. She there does, is though. A little, oh, I wish I had thrown the book across the room. I showed you that there are footnotes in it, but the footnotes are very, very sparse. She's not citing a lot of research in this book at all. It's mo That's probably a legitimate criticism, actually. There could for sure be more research in it. But then, you know, read the other books for that. Mostly anecdotal evidence. Let's keep going. Ah, on this one, we actually have something that I agree with. So very early on in the book, this is still introduction page five, Robin D'Angelo says, I believe that white progressives cause the most daily damage to people of color. I thought that was really interesting. And another interesting thing is this is clearly a book that is written for people who consider themselves politically progressive. That is who the audience of this book is for. I mean, she says it throughout the book. This is for progressives. This is for progressives. This is for progressives. Why would she be writing a book? specifically targeted at progressives i mean i think that that's a really interesting question to consider why why would that motivation be made so clear throughout the book that this is just for political progressives i'm pretty sure i can answer that why question not that she's interested but it's mostly because almost all conservatives certainly all the ones i have ever talked to on these issues react exactly like you do Carlin, they, they go like, oh, I can't believe you would make that suggestion. The, most of them are the epitome of white fragility as it's outlined in the book. All the same reactions that the book explains, um, that's how they react. And this is a pretty fragile response from someone like her. But uh, again, what would you expect? Because as if no one else that's not a political progressive, progressive wants to fight racism, right? Is that what she's saying? Or is that, is that simply the audience? Well, that that's mostly true. Reeled right in with this type of BS nonsense. Let's keep going. I've really never seen conservatives who are truly interested this one, sorry, in, I'm pulling up from my in stopping racism. They, you know, they, they say they are, but never really seen it tweets that I sent out just to just to make things easy so on this one I just want to start with the premise that uh, Robin DiAngelo's theory of white fragility that all white people are racist and they've always been racist and they'll no, always be racist no that's not what she says is on display anytime that we get upset or offended or angry no but it is absolutely on display right now that we are racist let's just take for a second and say that is an accurate theory. Bear with me. I don't actually mean that, but I'm, I'm, I'm making a point. So let's read what she says in this paragraph. In fact, when we try to talk openly about and honestly about race, white fragility quickly emerges as we are so often met with silence, defensiveness, argumentation, certitude, and uh -huh. other forms of pushback. That's These true. are not natural responses. That's wrong. That's wrong. What Robin D'Angelo is describing right here, silence, defensiveness, argumentation, certitude, and other forms of pushback, that is the very definition of fight or flight. Fight or flight is our natural response when we perceive a threat. So then to say... So why do you think you're feeling fight or flight responses just because 
you're talking about racism. Maybe, maybe that's a question we should be asking. These are not natural responses that we would do these things when we feel our survival is threatened. And keep in mind, too, it's not... when, she's, when I'm talking about survival in this case, she's going into organizations and doing this type of training and claiming, and I don't necessarily know that I believe the claims, but she's claiming that white people get angry and outraged if they have to do this type of training. It's and then so she's saying this true. is not a natural response. Well, of course it is. Because what's happening... It's not a natural response to to the suggestion that you might be wrong about something <laughs> like i can't even imagine that d'angelo's workshops are even that confrontational you know all they're really doing is saying like you know have you considered how you know there might be racist tendencies that you haven't addressed maybe because you're not as knowledgeable as, as you think you are, you're maybe not as self-aware as, as, you know, nobody's perfectly self-aware, right? So you can, like, you know, someone like me, I can, I've read lots of these books, I've listened to tons of people, but there could absolutely still could be some kind of racist tendencies inside me, because racism is a system, and you'll see Carlin try to, try to deny that, that it's systemic, but... It clearly is, and because it's systemic, it's built into the culture. So if you're socialized into this culture, you're you're going to feel certain ways. You're going to um, there's there's like an assumed racial hierarchy, um, and there's so many things that white people do to push back against it. And that's basically what this book is about, and it outlines it pretty well. And uh, you know, I'm not entirely sure what your objection is except that you're a little fragile is those white people those outraged angry white people if they really do exist they're afraid <laughs> of losing their job if they don't do this type of training that's how this stuff manifests in organizations so she's she's either wrong she's either lying about what people are doing or she's flat wrong about people when she says this is not a natural response it is a natural response that is what our fight or flight response is let's keep going all right, mm -hmm. on this one. Oh, we've got a whole bunch of stuff in this one. Let's let's read this whole paragraph. bunch of stuff. In addition to challenging our sense of ourselves as individuals, tackling group identity or challenges our belief system, are also excuse me, tackling group identity also challenges our belief in objectivity. And now she's going to go through a bunch of assumptions. See if you can identify the assumptions that she's about to go through. If group membership is relevant. Which then it is. we don't see the world from the universal human perspective, we but don't. from the perspective of a particular kind of human. Sort In of. this way, both ideologies are disrupted. Thus, reflecting on our racial frames is particularly challenging for many white people because we are taught that we have to have a racial viewpoint, that we are taught that to have a racial viewpoint is to be biased. Okay, so let's look at at least three assumptions that she's making in that paragraph. One, that our group membership is the most relevant what? part of our experience whoa. as human beings. The color of your skin. Whoa, 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 whoa. The most relevant? Is that what it says? Is the most relevant part of who you are and what you experience in this lifetime. That's assumption number one. No, she's saying it is relevant and it is. Again, we can learn about socialization, you know... Like, the more you learn about racism as a system, the more you realize that that's true. Especially for the kind of people that uh, D'Angelo talks about in this book. Who, you know, she gives examples of the type of people who, you know, they might not have had... They, they might not have many friends of color, um, or especially just growing up. They might have grown up in an all-white neighborhood, that kind of thing. I mean, shit, I did. Number two is that everyone who is in the same group as you, everyone who has the same skin color as you, sees the world in the same way and has the exact same experience. Well, and no, it doesn't really say that either. It just says that in a, in a very racist system, your, which I think we can't deny that it is, but you know, you can see my old videos for that if you do disagree. Um, in a really racist system, racial group membership 
is relevant. And it obviously is. And there are certain kind of... And, and yeah, she's speaking generally. Um, but there are certain frames that you view the world through just because you're white or black or something like that grown up in a place like the United States. That's, that's normal. Just because you don't get it doesn't mean she's wrong. Marie, that means all white people experience white fragility. It's just the way it is. Well, I haven't met white many white people who don't experience it. Those are assumptions. She hasn't proven them. She has not backed them up. Let's keep going. She hasn't backed them up, so she's wrong. All right, whatever. But he could be in an overwhelmingly white room of coworkers and exempt himself from examination of his whiteness because Italians were once discriminated against is an all too common example of individualism. So in this example, Robin D'Angelo has done a training in an organization and an Italian person has come up to her and, and she doesn't like it when, when white people ask her questions. She, she always demeans white people who are daring to true. ask her questions. In this example, an Italian American has came up to come up to her and he says, listen, Italians were once discriminated against in this country, which is absolutely true. It's true of the Irish as well. And what she says, essentially, and you see this a little later on. In fact, let's just go to the next thing. What she says that was, um, let's see, a more fruitful. So he comes up to her and asks her a question. And she's like, oh, how dare this white man come up and ask me a question? Because she considers him no. white. She doesn't consider him to be Italian. She considers him white. She <laughs> you says can be a more both. fruitful form of engagement because it expands rather than protects his current worldview mm-hmm. would have been to consider how Italian Americans were able to become white and Mm -hmm. how that assimilation has shaped his experiences in the present as a white man. That's not valid? That's incredibly racist. What? Not only did she say that him focusing on himself as an Italian American was not part of a group that he was in, but it was a form of individualism, which is makes no sense whatsoever. It she- makes absolute sense in the context of the book as she explained what individualism is just a couple pages before that. She's also saying that Italian Americans are basically white. They're, she's wiping their uh-huh. experience and their culture off the table. That's nope. incredibly racist. And no. it is not the last time we're going to see Robin D'Angelo be racist. <sighs> okay. When I saw, when I read the book, which, by the way, was just recently, um, I, I saw that example. I thought it was a pretty good example. Because what, what, this this guy is saying is that because of history alone um he's he you know shouldn't be considered white or he shouldn't consider that he has white privilege whereas really sometime in history italian americans and uh what was her example irish americans and so on they became white. They no longer became hyphenated Americans, right? And, uh, and, and D'Angelo's saying, I think this is a, a, a totally fair thing to say. She's saying, okay, well, so bear in mind, whatever happened to you before, now you're considered white. So, um, like, try thinking about, like, how you and your group were able to become white you know as you know as it's as the label is um with all the privileges that come with being white um i mean it's not like it's not like anyone's going to look at him and treat him in the same way that they might treat like a black person or something and yes of course people treat you differently depending on your skin color I mean, it, it's it's pretty obvious. I don't see why this is a bad point, and it's obviously not racist. How are you, like, erasing anything? She, she's not erasing anything in the past. Really, she's saying you should look at your own past and and understand your position in the present from it. But apparently it's racist to suggest that will be racist in the first half of this cursed book. Let's cursed. keep going. Okay, so what do I have underlined here? She says, therefore, if I am saying that my readers are racist or even worse, 
that all white people are racist. I am saying something deeply offensive. I am questioning my reader's very moral character. How can I make this claim when I don't even know my readers? Many of you have friends and loved ones of color, so how can you be racist? And then she goes on to say, if I am not using the definition of racism to mean the standard definition of racism, which is the ones that average people use, if I am not using this definition, de definition of racism, and I am not saying that you are immoral, what she's saying essentially is that the way that she proves her point that all white people are racist and all white people experience white fragility, the way that Robin D'Angelo is doing that is by changing the definition of racism. Okay. No, she isn't. Here's the thing about racism. There's, you, you've got the dictionary definition and you've got history. Okay, now, they're at odds. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but the, the history of racism is inseparable from racism. When we try to go by the dictionary definition of just like whatever it is, something like not liking someone because they're of a different supposed ethnic group, something along those lines, or discriminating against someone because of that. Um, the problem is that that very much individualizes everything, and it makes it sound like it's some kind of individual choice, whereas really racism, um, it, it has a discrete history that you need to understand, and in that, and that, that history has always been white supremacy. So racism, modern racism as we know it, comes from the European powers, and it's, it's white supremacy. That's the form it takes. There isn't really any other kind of racism that's relevant in a place like North America that's still a white-dominated settler society. Um, so when you, um, when you try to define it the way, as she calls them, average people define it, the problem is that you're basically erasing hundreds of years of history when you do that, or, or trying to separate this, this serious word that, that really does mean something. You're trying to separate it from all the history and everything that comes before it. But it's a very, very common thing among people on the right. They say, like, well, I personally haven't, like, hated on that person, therefore I'm not a racist. Well, it's much more useful to not to stop thinking in terms of individuals as a racist and not a racist, as, of course, Robin D'Angelo points out in a couple of places in her book, and like all the other books on anti-racism point out, but, you know, Carlin's never, never read any of those books. So if you have friends and family, as I do, I actually had friends tell me when I was pushing <coughs> back against them on this stupid book, they said, Carlin, we're not saying that you're racist and i said exactly. liz yes yes you are because that's what this book says this book says that all white people are racist it says that i am racist it's certainly saying that it's impossible for us to escape the influence of racism you should at least consider that it says that you're racist it says that everyone is racist and the only thing that we can do is pay robin d'angelo money to sit in our discomfort and work on our white fragility. That's exactly what it says. And the reason she can say that <laughs> is because exactly she changed the definition of racism. Let's keep going. <laughs> in this one, let's see. In this one, because race is a product of social forces, it has also manifested itself along class lines. Oh my God, this is incredibly racist. Get no, ready for it's it. true. Poor and working class people were not always perceived as fully white. So that's racist, apparently. <laughs> it's not historically accurate. It's just Robin DiAngelo's racism. <laughs> In a society that grants fewer opportunities to those not seen as white, economic and racial forces are inseparable. However, poor and working class whites were eventually granted full entry Okay, she, she's going to go into an important point in a minute. So I just wanted to mention um, that, that that part is basically true. Poor and working class people were, um, were kind of considered 
the barbarians. I made a, a whole series of videos on civilization and the barbarians, you know, and historically, again, you know, in Europe and the masses in the Americas as well, they were, it, it's true, basically, that they were considered, um, they, they used the same rhetoric among, like, the aristocracy and the kind of the managerial class or whatever you want to call it, um, about the poor in their own countries as they used about the people in, like, Africa or the Americas or wherever they were trying to conquer. Um, so, so that part is basically true. I'm not sure how it could be considered racist. I'm really, I'm quite confused about that part. But let's, let's keep going because the next part's good into whiteness to support to exploit labor if poor whites were focused on feeling superior to those below them in status they were less focused on those above that's true so she's saying what what, what the poor people what what the what the labor class what the blue collar workers should have been focused on is on the oppressors above them, the business uh -huh. owners. That th no. the woman is literally calling for communism here. That's what she's. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love that? <laughs> Suggesting that maybe instead of instead of white people taking their aggressions out on black people, they should focus on, like, the people creating the propaganda, the people forcing them into shitty systems of oppression, you know, that the, they couldn't, that they're not the problem, or even suggesting that they might be the problem, that we should stop focusing on, on our on our racial other or whatever and start focusing on the ruling class that's communism and communism is always wrong <laughs> yeah, this is a good one this is why occasionally i watch videos like this because they're really a a great source of entertainment calling for she goes on to say uh the poor and working class, if united across race, could be a powerful force to uh -huh. overthrow the oppressors. Yeah, but so. racial divisions have served to keep them from organizing against their own class who profits from their labor. Totally true. Robin D'Angelo in this one is not only saying that poor white people are racist because they're more focused on keeping keeping the black people beneath them down than they are on uh, subverting their oppressors. She's actually calling for a communist revolution. And this, that's what this calls for. That's what she's saying. This stuff is nuts. I swear to God. You can't make this stuff up. You can't, can't make, make it this up. Stuff up. Wait, okay, right, so you're gonna... Keep going. What? No, keep going. What? What? <sighs> okay, this is one thing that that conservatives and right-wingers, that they love to do. They, they put out this talking point. They, they put out some claim that a leftist has made, right? Anything at all. And they go... What are they talking about? That's ridiculous. Totally wrong. And then they just move on. And I go, wait, 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 wait. What's wrong about it? If you can't tell me that, then you don't have an argument. I, I, might, I might lose my voice. I was yelling a lot earlier, but we're going to persevere. We are not giving in to my white fragility in this particular one. Okay, let's see. <laughs> you already have. Many of us can acknowledge that we do feel some unease around certain groups of people, if only a heightened sense of self-consciousness, but this feeling doesn't come naturally. Our unease comes from living separately from a group of people while simultaneously absorbing incomplete or erroneous information about them. When the prejudices cause, when the prejudice causes me to act differently, I am less relaxed around you or I avoid interacting with you. I am now discriminating. Prejudice often manifests itself in action because the way I see the world drives my actions. Now, I wanted to throw Robin D'Angelo a bone with this one because she's right. That last sentence is right. The way you see the world, the inner dialogue you have in your head will dictate your actions in, cer in all circumstances. It doesn't matter. Whatever inner dialogue you have in your head about whatever is going on around you 
your actions will follow. So? But the rest of that paragraph is basically her admitting her own racism. And we're going to keep saying that. She does it again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. Let's keep going. So basically, you're saying that there are no white people who who follow that? That that's, that that's just wrong? <laughs> okay, lady. This one says... Um, this is essentially if if men were required to vote in or if, if this is about men giving women the right to vote essentially and she says but men as a group could and did deny women their civil rights yep. of course we got to get gender sure stuff did. thrown in here i'm not exactly sure why but that was it's also a comparison thrown in there. i thought and that was obvious say, men could only do so because they controlled all the institutions so basically the argument she's making is that Women only have rights because men who controlled all the institutions granted them the rights from on high. And it's exactly the same thing with white fragility. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same thing with yeah. the evil white people who control all the institutions and are the grantor they do. of rights to black people. Mm -hmm. But the question I have is this. The men, the men who gave women the right to vote, they had to vote to give women the right to vote didn't they what? like if, if these men are these men are, are men still misogynists yep. if they grant women the right to vote mm. i don't know just a just a little side note no, there. i don't get going. your point what's your point oh my god all right. if we're on track all the things i've covered so far i think this is just an interesting note everything that i've covered so far up to this video and i didn't even do all the tweets i had pulled up that only gets you to page 20 of the book this is a 150 page book that gets you to page 20. Well, we've already covered. Let's keep going. Mm. Oh, good. All right. Oh, in this one, I just thought this was interesting. So you're going to see, um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but she's talking about the metaphor of a bird cage to describe the it's interlocking forces of oppression. And when you're really close to a bird cage, you can see through without seeing the wires. And it's very different uh -huh. than if you're if you're far away from the bird cage. Yeah. Some sort of stupid bird cage analogy. Yeah, it's a Here's good metaphor. She does this all the time in the book. Instead of offering data, instead of providing data, she does to provide her data points to show empirical evidence. What she does is she offers an analogy. And by the time she's done with the analogy, what she wants is that you're going to forget that she never gave you data to prove the point that she wanted to make. Let's keep going. Wait, no. Okay. She okay. Offering metaphors and analogies is a great way of helping people understand. If she isn't using data in the, like, first, she, she said she's 20 pages in. So, so she doesn't offer data in the first 20 pages, therefore it's all wrong? I mean, I know from my own experience that a lot of these things are true. Why even, you know, why shit on a, a perfectly good metaphor when you know like you're not actually saying that it's wrong you're just saying well you don't have any data to to explain the bird cage well how, how are you supposed to provide data for that keep going we got a lot more to get through okay <clears throat> harris's analysis is useful because it shows how identity and perception of identity can grant or deny resources these resources include self-worth visibility, positive expectations, psychological freedom from the tether of race, freedom of movement, the sense of belonging, and a sense of entitlement to all the above. What is she saying here? She's saying that you have to be white in order to experience self-worth and have positive expectations. That's what this is saying. No. That you have to be white to have all those things. No, if no, you're no, not no. white, you just can't expect to have self-worth i mean <laughs> no it doesn't say that i thought it's kind of obvious but but look at it um it shows how identity and perceptions of identity can grant or deny resources that doesn't say if you're white you get these resources and if you're not white you don't get them i mean i mean she says like at, right at the beginning of the book that race is very complex and like you can't just collapse it all into a few simple explanations, but I think that's what Carlin is looking for here, you know? She's like, well, either explain it in one sentence, <laughs> um, and, and 
and or, or else I'll just ignore all the nuance of what you're saying. I mean, are you kidding me? This is one of the most racist things I've ever read. Let's mm -hmm, keep going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, here she's making a point about Jackie Robinson. She says, Jackie Robinson, the first black man whites allowed to play Major League Baseball. And I actually thought that was a really good point. I did. I have to throw another bone on this one. I thought that was a good point. But she spent the rest of the damn page completely diminishing Jackie Robinson's accomplishments. I couldn't help but think what? that, like, he, like, you know, regardless of, of whether or not he was the very best of what he did or if he was just the guy that the Whites chose to play baseball, he still accomplished a major feat. And he inspired so... a lot of people. And he opened the door to people of color playing in the major leagues, however that might have happened. And I agree that it probably should have happened sooner, and there were probably many deserving people who never got the shot. We can agree on that. But why does she have to diminish his accomplishments <laughs> diminish in the his process of making this point? Let's keep going. <laughs> okay. Although rare individual people of color may be inside the circles of power, she's making a point about how white people control all the institutions. Which Although obviously rare is individual true. people of color may be inside the circles of power, Colin Powell, Clarence Thomas, Marco Rubio, Barack Obama, they support the status quo and yeah. do not challenge racism in any way significant enough to be threatened. That's right. So I'm sure Barack Obama would really like to hear that, that he upheld a racist system. He did. Let's keep going. He did. All those people did. Whites also produce... <laughs> see? See what I mean by conservatives throwing, throwing a point out there and just saying, oh, this is wrong and, go, and moving on? and reinforce the dominant narratives of society, such as individualism and meritocracy, and use those narratives to explain the positions of other racial groups. So what she's saying here is the idea that you can achieve things through hard work and merit, that's for white people. That's for white people. Uh -huh. That's, so well, that's mostly true. That's so racist. No, she's explaining the, the system. <sighs> okay, so... So let's talk a little bit about this. She she talks she she says this in in a few parts of the book. She talks about what you know. She defines individualism as uh, trying to individualize, personalize racism, um, and say like it's down to me, it's down to the individual. And actually, um, on the one hand, she she talks about systems of racism, and actually, one of the biggest weaknesses of this book might be that it. She kind of puts all the onus on the individual instead of, like, the systems of power um, and the people on top and the propaganda and uh, the kind of the culture as a whole. There's so much more to it. And um, she kind of just focuses on the individual, which is okay for what it's worth, but it's not, um, you know, we, we could do a lot better. That's why a lot of these other books exist um, and, and they, they might be better. Um, and... She, you know, Carlin here is saying that meritocracy isn't for for people of color and stuff. Well, it kind of isn't, <laughs> and that's always been the point of racism, or, or or one of the main points of racism to uh, preserve um, the the superior position of white people over um, the the subordinated races, and. Um, you know, that's that's still true to this day. And the idea that the U.S. is a meritocracy is, is really quite a joke. And really, we should be attacking that idea. The, the whole thing about... Well, anyway, uh, let's, let's keep going. Whatever. What is that? The bigotry of low expectations made visible in a book saying it's combating racism? Let's keep going. Got a lot more. Let's yeah, keep going. Yeah. We're doing rapid fire. Rapid fire white fragility. The failure to acknowledge white supremacy protects it, protects yep. it from examination so and true. holds it in place. Very true. I'm going to say that again because I thought this was really interesting. So the true. The failure to acknowledge white supremacy protects it from examination and holds it in place. The reason I thought that was interesting is Robin DiAngelo's whole argument with white fragility is that you can't question it. In fact, she gets very offended no. when she's questioned by white people. What? about white fragility no. and so isn't it isn't this saying exactly the same thing isn't this saying no. that 
every no, white this isn't the same thing as saying it what like every white person is racist and if they question <laughs> their own racism that that's just more proof that they're racist what it's no the same thing is what she's saying no it isn't just do here let's she's keep going. so not saying that oh my god given that the majority of white people live in racial isolation from mm. people of color and black people yeah i had questions about this one too have authentic Cross racial relationships. I wondered white about White people it. are deeply influenced by racial messages in film. What she's saying here is that white people don't have black friends in real life, and their only perception of black people is in the movies. Well, she's I not saying not all white people, stuff up. Let's but she's certainly going. saying some white people, and that's okay. So, so I, yeah, I had some some questions about that part too. I was curious. I I thought um, again to give a kind of a bone to Carlin here. I. I would think that is one of those places that really did kind of require some some data of some kind. Um, like, you know, why why would you even say that if you don't have any any data on it? There's there's going to be data somewhere on the internet that you can find. So you know, maybe maybe that's what it's about. You know, go 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 look it up yourself. Um, I'm because you know for sure it's true. If you're if you're saying like some white people, many white people don't have many you know authentic uh, cross racial relationships or whatever word she uses, um, I'm sure that that's true. But I'm curious as to how true. You know, is it like fifty percent of white people? Is it ninety percent of white people? It could be. Another thing about that um, that she she doesn't mention, as far as I remember, in the book. Um, is that you could still have black... Oh, well, I guess she sort of talks about it. But you, you can still have, like, black friends, but still have latent anti-blackness, you know, feelings of anti-blackness. Even if they're, like, your best friend or whatever, they're, they're still... You know, in fact, you could be surrounded by black people and still say, like, well, these are the good ones. Do you know what I mean? So, so they're even among people who have, like these genuine uh, off the relationships with people of color, they still might um, harbor some kind of racist feelings. It's a superior in culture and achievement and views people of color as generally of less social, social, economic, and political consequence. People of color are seen as inferior to whites in the making and keeping of the nation. Doesn't that sound like it was mm-hmm. written by an incredibly racist person? She she offers nothing to back this up. No, that there's no footnote there. There's no footnote. She offers nothing to back this up. This is her own experience. Well, she's kind of already no explained that. No one forced Robin D'Angelo to sit the down rest of the and book. write a racist book. That is a completely racist <laughs> statement just... <laughs> written by a very racist woman. Let's okay, keep going. Okay, sure, lady. So racist. Countless studies show empirically that people of color are discriminated against right. in the workplace. So? In order to prove that, she cites one study, one study about people with so black look sounding for the names others. not getting called back for job interviews as much as people with white sounding names. Now, that's a legit thing. That's something that we should work on. But it is not countless studies that improve empirically that people of color are discriminated against in the workplace just not okay so she should cite more studies okay sure or you could google it i had with a white friend she was telling me about how a white couple she knew had just moved to new orleans and bought a house Mm -hmm. for a mere twenty five thousand dollars of course she added immediately they also had to buy a gun and joan is afraid to leave the house i immediately knew they had bought a house in a black neighborhood Uh so why is Robin D'Angelo hanging out with racist friends when she is the premier <laughs> anti-racist trainer right now in the country? Because that sounds incredibly racist to me. Does that sound racist to you? Because it sounds incredibly racist yes, to me. Yes, although it does sound pretty typical. Friends, Robin? Why? Why haven't you had them sit in their discomfort and go to one of your workshops? Why? Let's keep going. <laughs> Maybe she did and it didn't work. Um, in this one... Every aspect of being white discussed in this chapter is shared by virtually all white people in the Western context generally and the U.S. context specifically. She provided no evidence in this chapter, zero evidence to say that everything she talked about in this chapter was true of all white people. Doesn't mean it's not true, though. Let's move on. Let's see what she says. Indeed, the forces of racism were shaping me before I even 
even took my first breath. Now th That's a good example of systemic racism. She's right. That's a great point. She makes a good point in that paragraph. At this point, this is the point where I bust out laughing hysterically. Literally, I couldn't help myself. This is when I made that video you saw at the beginning of the video. Like, I just could not help myself. The forces of racism were shaping me while I was still in the wound. Are you kidding me? Let's go on. Aha, so funny, but I can't refute this it. This is why I'm losing my mind, people. This is why I'm crazy. This is, oh, oh, this is one of my favorite examples of racism. In this is why you're fragile. The word is fragile, Carlin. The entire book. For example, I was invited to the retirement party of a white friend. The party was a potluck picnic held in a public park. <laughs> As I walked down the slope toward the picnic shelters, I noticed two parties going on side by side. One gathering was primarily composed of white people, and the other appeared to be all black people. I experienced a sense of disequilibrium as I approached, and I had to choose which party was my friends. I felt a mild sense of anxiety as I considered that I might have to enter the all-black group. Then mild relief when I realized that my friend was in the other group. That's racist! That is racist! That's a completely racist statement! So, what it is, is showing an example of white fragility there you know and what she's saying is that even she the white fragility trainer and expert or whatever even she feels it sometimes that it's almost impossible to avoid so yeah it's racist in a sense because it comes from the system of racism um let's just not purely individualize racism and say well you did this so you're racist the point is where did these feelings come from? Why did you feel those w that way? Try to, you know, find the answer, root it out of yourself, and look, you know, look at the wider world. How did they, you know, how did it shape you to, to feel this way? If you are approaching... A group of, of two parties, and one is black and one is white, and you are afraid of going to the black potluck? That is racist. You are a racist. You might actually need this book. You might connect very well <laughs> with Robin D'Angelo, because that is a completely racist statement. Let's... Whereas Carlin's like, I've never felt Let's anything like that ever before. I'm perfect. I'm not racist. I have made the assumption myself that when I have been unable to hide my surprise that the black man is the school principal, or when I ask a Latinx woman <laughs> kneeling in her garden if this is her house, that's racist, Robin D'Angelo. She does this kind over of. and over again. There are so many stories in this book yeah, that are just she's... completely unnecessary to the book that she adds in there to confess her sin of racism. I kind of agree that like those a lot of those stories really aren't necessary but she's really just trying to say that that it's normal but that it's not necessary or you can you know you can learn you can get over it let's keep going uh what am i what is what am oh okay i know what i was saying here okay what she's saying is basically that that people of color don't work in the same jobs as white people that's what she's saying and although i may no, not exactly a token person of color there is definitely a racial division of labor or during the hiring process if i'm not specifically applying to an organization founded by people of color the majority of those i interact with will share my race that's true once hired I won't have to deal with my coworkers' resentment that I only got the job because I am white. Yeah, that's a good point because, um, of course, a lot of people, a lot of white people in, in the United States, you know, their biggest, uh, you know, their biggest problem that they're always talking about is like affirmative action, which is very, a very, very weak um, form of anti-discrimination, I think. Not that it's not necessary, but it's just a very small thing. But, you know, they make this huge deal out of it. So, um, so how many, you know, I don't know how many times this has happened, but I'm guessing about a million, like, black people or, like, or, or other people of color who've attained, like, this white-collar position, you, you know, the other... The other white people in the office, you know, the, the majority, obviously, 
who will be, you know, they'll kind of look at them like, oh, yeah, you, you, affirmative action, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, maybe we shouldn't be thinking that. Maybe that's a problem. Maybe the problem is how white people think and act all the time, but she refuses to consider that. I am assumed to be the most qualified. So what Robin D'Angelo is saying here is that if she, the white lady, gets hired, it's going to be because of her merit. But if a person of color gets hired to work in the same organization, it's going to be because they were a token person. Possibly, of it she's could be. She's literally tokenizing people. That's no, racist. She's saying, Let's keep going. No, she's saying you shouldn't tokenize people. I might worry about my class status in some settings. For example, when attending a high society event such as a museum opening or an art auction and then this one i commented like this book may as well be called confessions of bougie white women who are working through their own <laughs> guilt regarding their own obvious privilege and racism and trying to bring everything else down with her that's what this is that i mean that's not quite racist but that's basically saying oh, i am an uppity white woman that goes to high class <laughs> events and i I worry about my own racism when I go to these events. That's not what she's saying. What? Where do you get that shit from? <laughs> what she's saying is that, in this case, class uh, is what's affecting her. But, as she says right in that like same paragraph that you supposedly read, racism doesn't affect her whereas if you're at some kind of high society event and you're black or or i don't know what then a lot of people will look at you like oh uh, we have black people in our in our society or we have oh oh do you uh, do you work here or something like that i mean again i don't know how how often this happens but i mean there's definitely discrimination there you're kind of trying to pretend that there isn't, and you're changing the argument. Let's keep going. She might be accused of being politically correct, or be perceived yeah. as angry, yeah. humorless, combative, right wingers always insult you by saying politically what she's correct. What talking about here is a, a white person who calls out people on their racism so what robin d'angelo asserts is that it is the responsibility of white people if someone says something racist around you it is the responsibility yeah. of white people to call them out and say stop okay. being racist good well, then she says well white people should be they might not want to do this because someone might say they're politically correct that's and true kind of they get called politically correct all the freaking time as if that's wrong sense of humor if they do and this is a form of social coercion how it ironic is. is it that this woman who throws the term racist around like willy-nilly like it means nothing is somehow threatened by the fact that someone might call you politically correct as a form of social coercion let's keep going wait no oh god damn it <laughs> how often do you have to hear Right-wingers throw the term politically correct around as, like, an insult, as a way of shutting somebody up before you can realize that it is a form of social coercion, and it's a great example of what she's talking about in this chapter. This chapter is all about, um, I think she calls it white solidarity, some, something along those lines, um, how... Uh, you know, white people, inst you know, when they, when they see another white person do something racist, instead of calling them out on it, they go like, oh, it wasn't so bad, it wasn't that racist, you're, you're not a racist, don't worry, you know, that kind of thing. Why? Why shouldn't we be calling people out, Carlin? The most profound message of racial segregation may be the absence of people of color from our lives is no real loss. The, the thought I had with this one... Okay, out of is context? Like, then why are people on the left 
constantly trying to segregate races. Why? I mean, we saw <laughs> this in the, in the Chaz or the Chopper or whatever in Seattle. They had black only areas. Okay. Like, why, why are people on the left <laughs> trying to promote racial segregation if they think that people of color matter in their lives like They'll just I make up shit about the left i love having variety of people around me from all different backgrounds and experiences and races and genders and identities and all those things like everyone is welcome in my life i'm not going to create little freaking groups where i hang they out don't with segregate you know, the white friends in this place and the they just try to understand stupid, right that's the stupid. prejudices against what them what she's saying here is that you know racial segregation would lead to a profound loss of experience in our lives and she's right she's right so, so then why do people on the left constantly try to segregate races? Let's keep just going. Just make more shit up, why don't you? Oh, this is this right here. This is like the most racist statement that I've gotten to so far in the book. Okay, let's let's see if you can count <clears throat> the instances of racism in this statement. My psychosocial development was inculcated in a white supremacist culture in which I am in the superior group uh -huh. she just so calls is yours. herself superior no she, don't you get it? what she's trying to say superior is is the 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 perception of the culture and the system it's not that she's saying white people are superior like how deliberately ignorant do you have to be she just said she's in the superior group that's point one telling me not to telling me to treat everyone the same is not enough to override this socialization so she can't treat people the same nor is it humanly possible I... so maybe you're only thinking you're treating people the same maybe that's the problem i was raised in a society that taught me there was no loss in the absence of people of color that their experience right. was that their excuse me that their absence was a good and desirable thing to be sought and maintained. Right, a racist society will do that. In fact, she, she grew up in a segregated environment. That's point number three. Right, most this of us do. This attitude shaped every aspect of my self-identity. My interests, investments, what I care about, what I don't, blah, 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 blah. These attitudes shaped every part of her identity. So what she's saying here in this one paragraph... Robin D'Angelo was taught that she was part of a superior group. Right, she was. She was taught was. that it is not possible to so treat everyone the same. So were you. She was taught that racial segregation is good. And these attitudes informed every part of her identity. Robin D'Angelo is racist. She's racist. Okay. I think it's kind of obvious that she's using herself as an example, that D'Angelo is using herself as an example there of, of a quite a typical white person uh, experience in North America I, and I mean it was that was my experience too but just like D'Angelo I've you know I've I've worked on myself I've worked hard I've tried to uproot any racist tendencies I have and now I'm like very firmly anti-racist and I make videos like this that are the point of which is anti-racism um to you know but but like I I don't get why Carlin is like deliberately focusing on her on the literal meaning of her words as if she couldn't figure out that it's supposed to you know that it's not just about uh d'angelo herself that's what this says let's keep going we got a couple more goody many whites have no cross-racial friendships at all okay, but so even those that have cross-racial friendships use that as evidence of their lack of racism yep okay so what she's saying here let me paraphrase this true most white people don't have black friends, but even if they do have black friends, they're still racist. <laughs> okay, so again, racism is a system. And it's not just... I mean, D'Angelo has already explained all this in the book earlier. So if she actually read the book as she says she did, or the first half of the book, sorry, um, then she, would, she should understand this. That it's not like a, a purely individual thing you're the one carlin trying to separate people into racist and non-racist boxes the the point is that it, it doesn't work that way in fact it says in the sentence invoke the binary of racist bad not racist good okay um and 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 it's true like i was like that too that was a good example of how i was you know fragile you know, I would say, like, hey, I have cross-racial friendships and stuff, you know. So, you know, so obviously 
I can't be racist. But that's totally missing the point. That the point that D'Angelo has already made. Because white people are always racist, no matter what, no matter what. No and matter final, what. That's it. That's it. That's, that's that's actually the last one. That's it. So if you take a look at her, um, you know, at her channel, you know, you've got like uh, seventy-four thousand subscribers. Quite nice. She's got she she's spent a lot of time on videos about why white fragility is wrong. To me, there's nothing more fragile than what she could have done. Debunking the notion of white supremacy cultures. There's no such thing as white supremacy culture. <laughs> Don't be silly. Um, she's, in fact, there's four parts on it. Former social justice warrior. Um, why does white fragility tell people to be less white? Well, it doesn't, but okay, whatever. Um, all this stuff about anti-racists. Okay, yeah. Um, oh my god, there's a seminar on deconstructing whiteness. Oh my god. That's terrible. <laughs> it's, it's a shame, really, because it seems like one of those things that Carlin might be able to benefit from actually <laughs> um so like i say there are plenty of legitimate criticisms of robin d'angelo's work and i uh, there's a bunch of links in uh in the description um but but for short examples you could say um that she centers herself a white woman and and centers whiteness when she could be centering like black brown and indigenous people and their voices um she doesn't include a lot of historical analysis in her workshops when uh, history is essential for understanding why race, what racism is and why it's systemic and why the dictionary definition of it is basically worthless. Um, she Again, she puts all her um, onus on the individual and kind of ignores power dynamics and doesn't really propose systemic changes. She... Uh, oh, and, and, and like Carlin apparently recently made a video on um you know the this anti-bias and diversity training studies seem to show that they don't have a lot of impact mostly they're just great corporate pr um and also that uh, adopting the vocabulary of white fragility has made it easier for you know so-called progressive white people to avoid doing the work they need to do and fix any of the racist tendencies they might have. But Carlin's video? That's not really criticism. In fact, what she's showing is um, a great example of not engaging with a book. This is something we learned in in, universe, in social sciences in university. You know, there's there's a big difference between reading a book just kind of looking at the words as it were and taking them in and engaging with a book where you really think about it deeply and and you don't take things out of context <laughs> mostly what carlin does here is a very selective reading and a selective understanding and it's based on preserving rather than challenging carlin's reductive worldview so so why is she like that? Why would she make a video like this? Well, there's a lot of possible reasons. Again, we're looking at someone with 74,000 uh, channel subscribers, so money could be part of it, you know? Um, it's, there's, there's a couple of other things, though. There's, I mean, fragility itself is, is, a, is what it could be. I mean, you know, I, I would say that this video is a great example of white fragility that that she um you know like yeah she didn't slam her book on on the table she just threw it across the room yeah she didn't scream and run out of the room instead she laughed and go and said toxic and cursed and stuff like that um the, the third reason that I think it could be is that there's a certain commitment on the right. And I use the word commitment. There's a right-wing commitment to not understanding a lot of things. Racism is one of them, and whiteness, and white fragility, and white privilege. 
Um, these, it, it, they, they can't understand them. It's, it would destroy their whole world view. Um, you know, white privilege is built into right wing ideology, and white fragility is is really the knee jerk defense mechanism. And D'Angelo talks about it in her book. She explains that it's and it's a pretty cogent explanation. And of course, Carlin um, doesn't get into that. Um, if you want to be anti racist, there's a lot you can learn. You, it's it's not hard. Learn the history of the country where you're from and the racism behind it and you'll probably see where racism comes from learn the history of whiteness itself this coded racial characteristic learn the history of slavery um, learn the history of the genocide of the native peoples you can you can see racism as a system operating there um, while you're at it learn about intersectionality Learn about your own socialization into a white settler colony. Learn about our cognitive biases and blind spots. Maybe that would have helped her to, uh, to break through to understanding the book a little better. Or just learn how to engage with a book critically rather than dismissing it because your ideology won't let you agree with it. Please. If you have an opinion on racism and whiteness and history, go study it. <laughs> and please start learning from black and brown people. You don't have to look at my recommendations. You can listen to them on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and read their books and publications. Don't be fragile like Carlin. Okay, thanks. <laughs>